You are listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. This is episode 182, Gregory Luce. I'm your host, Haley Radke. I am so excited to introduce you to Gregory Luce today, the attorney behind Adoptee Rights Law. We get to hear some of Greg's personal story today, including the five-year court battle it took for him to receive his records. We talk about some of the typical arguments adoptee activists hear from legislators against original birth certificate access and what impact DNA testing access has had on OBC legislation. Greg also challenges us to make sure we're listening to all adoptee voices. Greg is a lawyer, but he's not giving us legal advice during this episode. We wrap up with some recommended resources, and as always, links to everything we'll be talking about today are on the website, adoptieson.com. Let's listen in. I'm so pleased to welcome to Adoptees On, Gregory Luce. Welcome, Gregory. Hi, Haley. It's good to be here. I would... L- I'm, okay, first of all, I'm so thrilled to talk with you because I've followed you for years on Twitter have learned so much from you, but I'm really excited to get to hear some of your personal story. So would you mind sharing some of that with us today? I am a DC born and adopted uh, person. I was born in 1965 in the District of Columbia. And seven days later, I ended up in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland with um, my adoptive parents. And I have an adoptive brother as well. And I my story is probably pretty typical for most domestic adoptees, maybe most white domestic adoptees, but uh, I grew up always knowing I was adopted. I did wonder quite a bit as I got into my adolescence and then wondered quite a bit more and sort of had a breakdown when, um, as I think a lot of adoptees do, when they are about to become parents or have just become parents. And that was my sort of breaking point in trying to figure out who I am, where I came from, and to get information about that. And that was in, see, it goes way back to 1999, 2000. As I, I didn't really know anything about getting your records. And, and in fact, I think back in 2000, I was surprised to learn that I have two birth certificates. I didn't know that there was an original. And once I found out there was an original, it's like, oh, whoa, they're hiding that from me. It's in a court somewhere and I can get it. So I researched it a little bit and, um, you know, I'm an attorney. I was an attorney at that point too. So I kind of knew what I was doing for the courts in the district of Columbia. It just said, you know, fill out this form, um, submit $80 and you'll, um, be heard by the court. And so I did that and I got a, an order back saying, yes, we are unsealing your records. And so I'm like, woohoo, that was easy. And it didn't mean what it, said it meant though. It meant that they're going to unseal my file and then kick it over to the adoption agency. And then I got a letter shortly after from the adoption agency saying, well, if you pay us $500, we'll search for your parents and um, see if we can get your parents' consent. And I, I was not interested in that. I, you know, I'm not, I wasn't prepared for a reunion. I wasn't prepared to meet my parents. And so I said, no, thanks. So then with shortly after that, maybe six months, I had I had forgotten that I had done a one of these. They used to be private; these private registries. I think they still exist. And this private registry was um, related to the D.C. area, so Maryland, Virginia, D.C., maybe parts of West Virginia. And lo and behold, there's a match in um, the fall of 2000, and I met my birth mother through that. I mean, there's a and we met in. Towards the end of 2000, and then I think, if I'm still remembering correctly, she died 169 days later. So we did get to know each other. It was a wonderful reunion. She had been battling cancer for quite some time, and um, it's my belief she held on for this amount of time before to know that I was still alive and, and doing well. I ended up inheriting all of her records. She, I was an only child. Um, she later married my birth father and they later got divorced as well but i had thousands of documents from her and so i rebuilt her life and rebuilt her life so i would understand it and i became essentially her biographer or her her historian and then um about uh in 2015 and these things always take so much so much time you you sit on it you think through it you're not quite sure what you want to do 
life gets in the way. But in 2015, I said, you know, I'm going to give it another chance. And this time I'm going to go whole hog and, and I'm going to throw the book at the court to try to get my records. And so I wrote a 35 page petition and memorandum and filed it with the court. And it took five years and two denials from the, the court, as well as a court of appeals case in DC when they finally said, yes, you can have your original birth record and your father's name will be unredacted because their final decision at the trial court was, yes, you can have your records. We need to figure out the privacy interests of your deceased mother. And we're not going to, even though you know the name of your father, we're not going to give you his name. Uh, we're going to redact that. And I got a redacted uh, original birth record. That was what I appealed. And one on that part, it's changed DC law a little bit in that respect. It means that consent of the birth parents is not the linchpin there. It has to take into account the paramount interest of the adopted person. But they do still um, attempt to contact the birth parents in DC to determine if they would release or what their preference is for releasing the records. I'm in a long snail mail relationship with my birth father. We write letters plunk them in the mail and open them and read them and reply maybe a few months later. So that uh, is ongoing and very slow. And I think eventually we'll meet at some point. But through all that, I mean, after coming away from, from 2015, for the two years it took me just to navigate the courts in D.C., I, I said, you know, this is nuts. This is crazy. I'm a lawyer. And it takes me this much effort to challenge the court and to try to get my records what's it like in the rest of the states and that's when i began my sort of a new turn in my legal career and i became what i call myself the an adoptee rights lawyer i think i'm the only one in the country because you know, there's, not, there's not many attorneys who do this for full time and uh began adoptee rights law center as a law firm that re represents adult adopted people and that grew into not only birth records and identity documents, but also representing intercountry adoptees who either are having trouble proving citizenship or need to secure citizenship because they did not get it um, when they were young. So that's where I am today. It's been crazy four years now. So I, you know, when you say we haven't spoken for years, I still think I started this last month. I mean, it just feels that way to me, but it's been like... It's been four years of doing this, and there's so much has happened in those four years. And so I'm, I'm glad it feels new to me still. What kind of law did you practice before starting this? All kinds. I clerked for a judge for a couple of years. I did employment law for a few years. I was a technology person at the State Bar Association. I ran a nonprofit um, that organized low-income and uh, tenants in their buildings to fix their buildings up. I don't stay in, in positions very long. I just hop around because I get bored. But this is the one that's kept me, I think, the longest of any is this work here because it's so meaningful and, and so personal. And it's actually really, really gratifying. So, yeah, I did it all. I mean, I've done litigation, family law, you name it. I've, you know, the only thing I haven't done, I sort of, and I have not done criminal law, although I think I did get thrown into court one time for a client and had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. Well, because I remember when you started your Twitter account and just thinking, oh, this is really cool. This is fascinating to me. And I'm Canadian. So but of course, most of my guests are American. And so I follow very closely what's happening down there in terms of legislation and things. So it's amazing to me. I can't like you. You kind of glossed over this. But you change DC law. That's amazing to to have the interest of the adoptee as paramount. I mean, that's a big deal. It it is. It's uh you know, it's not unrestricted right that you get through legislation, which is the next step. But it that's why I got into this was to figure out a way to change the law and figure out a way to make it so you do have an unrestricted right to request and obtain your original birth record if you're a domestic adoptee. And, and it, that's, and, but obviously what happens with the courts, it takes such a long time and you have to have someone like me that's willing to stick in there for four or five years in litigation. And there's not many people who really want to do that. And also, I mean, frankly, most of us wouldn't have the resources to pay for your services for that long. 
Right. Yeah. If I were to have paid myself for what I did, it would be forty to fifty thousand dollars. I mean, that's what my legal fees probably would have been in the end if I had hired an attorney. I mean, some people say, "Why did you hire an attorney?" And well, that's the reason. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god. And goodness. that's why. I mean, and and so that was the other part of forming Adoptive Rights Law Center. I'm in a part of my life where I'm, I call myself a stay at home lawyer, where I'm, I've been taking care of the kids while my, my wife works and doing sort of part time work. And so I had the, I didn't, we, we didn't need, I mean, I'm privileged not to need to work to earn money in that sense. I mean, it's something we still need to, to worry about, but not in the sense that many other people have to worry about. And so I started out with almost entirely pro bono cases because I knew that adoptees did not have the resources to pay a thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollars to file a court case. And I've continued to do that. I have because there's so much demand though, I have been fairly careful now about what cases I take pro bono. And then those cases where a client can afford, I'll have a like a low flat fee that would cover petitioning a court and getting records, the whole, the whole case, as opposed to an hourly fee. So that, and that would range, I mean, it's cheaper than hiring and at least in Minnesota, it's cheaper than paying a thousand dollars, which is what it takes for the major adoption agency here to launch a search. And those searches depend upon consent to get any information back. So I'm, I'm cheaper than the adoption agencies and, and on, in purpose and still try to keep my service is pro bono and most of my intercountry adoptee cases are pro bono. Not all, but most. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of my way of giving to the community, but also, well, keep them busy (laughs) (laughs) in an area, in an area that I really love. So, yeah. Well, I, I, I didn't know your story before you shared it. And, um, you know, I usually make notes and and I, you know, do research before my interviews. And I had a note to ask you about what your thoughts on mutual consent registries were. And then it turns out that that's actually how you found your birth mother. Right. I mean, they never work. They, I mean, they're <laughs> notorious and they are notoriously ineffective. And lo and behold. Sorry, I, I just should just make a little note there. The reason I wanted to ask you that was because that's given as a reason, like, well, mutual consent registries are available. So that's how, what you should use, you know, to search from some right. legislators. I've heard that argument. Right. No, they're just so terribly ineffective. No one knows about them. You have to sort of get lucky to find out about them. There has to be a match. They often don't work anyways, even if there is a match there, because they're, something's messed up in the search algorithm or the search database. I mean, I just read a story in New York where they um, currently have an unrestricted right now. They changed a lot. We've changed it. We helped change the law there. But this is, these were two siblings who had both registered for the registry there 27 years ago. And they just found out from the registry 27 years later. So the registry did not work in that case. And that's typical, I think for many of these registries and they're just com- completely ineffective. Mm-hmm. And of course that's what that's so what's so interesting about my story is that they it worked and it worked 6 months before my mother died. So just, you know, it, it, quite amazing that it that's what happened. And this is, you know, and it worked 6 months after 6 months before she died and 6 months after I had first petitioned the court. And the court had nothing to do with her registering. She just happened to register in, you know, I think in October of 2000. And I had registered, I think, back in 1987 or something. So that was, you know, 13 years there. I remember filling out those things as a teenager. You know, like we had the Internet. I had, um, you know, old computer. But I mean, well, it wasn't old. It was new. <laughs> but, you know, it was like an, an Amiga or something. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, we had Apple for a while. And then I don't know what it was when we switched to PC. But I remember just like randomly filling out these online red database things and like nothing ever came of that for me. But that was, you know, that was in the olden days. Well, obviously, I had forgotten completely that I had registered. And then up pops an email from the administrator of this registry and everything's changed from there. Mm hmm. Well, I find this really interesting because you have worked on 
changing statewide legislation, but also it's just like one off going to unseal one person at a time kind of a deal. So can you talk about the differences of those things? I mean, it's fairly obvious to me, but for a lot of people, they don't understand like closed records, like you, you've got the whole, you've got this whole nail down. So can you, can you tell us that about that, please? Yeah. And it's a great question because I, it's something I think about all the time. Well, there are two approaches you could take when you believe you have a right to obtain your original birth record. One is change the legislation so that they recognize that right, or in many cases, restore it in the state that used to have it. And the other is to find a legal argument that would make the courts uh, recognize uh, that right um, as a right. And the legislation is actually probably easier to do as hard as it is. It's probably easier to change the law than to establish a right through the courts. And so you have to have these dual tracks going, though, in which um, you're trying to pursue this right through legislation, but you're also trying to convince legislators that it is a right and they recognize it as a right. Because that's the, part of creating a right is advocating for the belief that it is a right. And that's really important to, to realize that you don't so much, it, it is the pressure that you put on society through legislatures that will lead to them saying, well, yeah, you're right. If you put it that way, it really is a a right. And how you define that is going to be the big question, both for legislation and both for the courts. And if you're sort of narrowly looking at it and you're narrowly saying we have an absolute right to the original birth record, that's going to be much harder to prove than we have a right to identity. And this is where I'm sort of moving in how I'm analyzing these things legally is that there's a much broader right to identity, to heritage, to citizenship that relates to birth. And that is the right that's really at issue. And that's why I'm so excited in some ways that in more recently I've been connecting with the donor conceived community who have these same identity rights that come up. They're, they call them genetic identity rights or any number of different Rights, and it's a very complicated area, but it is it, it encompasses this broad right to your own identity, and I think that's where we're going to find a lot of support moving toward moving into the future. It's not a very so that the the right to the birth record is a right that arises out of a right to full identity, and so I'm we're, I'm seeing organizations arising. And there's one in Switzerland now called um, ChildIdentity.org. I think there's a hyphen between child and identity. And it looks at identity from the point of view that birth certificates, everyone in the entire world does not get a birth certificate. There are many countries that have pretty lax systems to even record a birth. And so that in itself is a, is a right to have a birth certificate or a birth record. And I've had clients who had, haven't had them. Um, that creates all sorts of, all sorts of problems and moving through the world. But this um, organization in Switzerland, and there are many others probably like it, uh, take a really broad look at identity. And, then, and within that is a right to birth certificate, a right to know who's on your birth certificate, a right to know your parents, uh, who they are. And there's no general right to relationship unless that relationship is through the birth parent before they relinquish or uh, surrender a child. But even then, there's, there's going to be some rights that attach to um, that relationship. It's but any adult doesn't have a right to a relationship with another adult. We're not talking about relationship rights. We're talking about identity rights. Right. Yeah. Okay. I have never heard it put that way. And that's really fascinating because I, I was just looking up and I wanted to ask you this too, um, because I was watching some of the videos that you've made and I wondered if you could tell us what happened in California in 1935. <laughs> so my, my theory with California, I don't think anyone really knows, but my theory with California, it was caught up a little bit with the Georgia Tan scandal. I mean, Georgia Tan was definitely involved with a lot of Hollywood adoptions and that you had celebrity adoptions as well in California. And what was happening there was you can request the birth record of anyone in California. You still can actually. 
but in the 1930s, the people who knew this and knew possibly there was an adoption would request the birth record of that child or the and would try to blackmail the adoptive parents to say we're going to tell and this is which is what's so odd to me we'll t- we're going to tell the kid that the kid's adopted that was the blackmail not that that they adopted a child but we're going to tell the kid it was adopted uh, so it's sort of wrapped up in that whole fiction as, as if they're born to the parent and blackmail was possible because it was so secret that you actually adopted a, a person and so in 1935 California became the first state in the country to seal the birth records to everybody, including the adopted person. And, but the genesis of that was around potential blackmail that existed at the time. So my theory is there's Georgia Tan, there's celebrities, there's actual blackmail going on, but it had nothing to do with protecting the birth parent, which is what it eventually became. That eventually became the narrative in the U S that I, I love that you said that because what I was reading was uh, talking about hiding from the adopted person, the fact that they're illegitimate and like covering that. So that's a really interesting twist. Right. I mean, yeah, it would have been very different in Idaho. You don't have a whole lot of, you know, celebrity birth the adoptions in Idaho or Oklahoma or wherever. But yeah, illeg- illegitimacy was a huge factor. Hide the, hide the, um, the child's illegitimate status by essentially legitimizing them through adoption. And that was the other main major impetus to, to do that. But in most cases, as you probably know, the records were not sealed to the adult later. That started to really come into play in the 40s and 50s, into the 60s, even into the 70s. In fact, I think Pennsylvania became the last state in 84 to to seal their records because that that video that i mentioned greg has you know you've got this green map and then so california goes red and then Mm -hmm. and then the states just go blink 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 on it like right and so now what are your feelings on okay first of all i can't believe you said you think this is easier through legislation that kind of blew my mind. Well, uh, let me say, let me say this though. I, I think I would, I, I probably quit try or threaten to quit uh, every day doing legislation because it's so, so exhausting, but I do think it's the route that's easiest to, um, I mean, if you're looking at time, that's the easiest one to change, but yeah, but it is, it is very frustrating. So, so easier, but not easy. <laughs> no, no, not at all. In fact, the, the devices, well, I should, I don't, I think the device of death is actually over, over played within the adoptee community, but, uh, I would say just the opinions within adoption itself are very, um, exhausting. And a lot of those actually are coming from legislators and how they view adopted, adopted people and all the stereotypes they bring to the equation of determining whether this adopted person deserves a birth record. And we saw that played out. I don't, we saw that played out in Maryland this past session. And, um, that was pretty painful to watch. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you mean by how they see adoptees? I know I was in a session with you at a, at a conference where Claire McGetrick was talking about some of these things and about how to approach legislators. And from us coming with this person, we come with all the adoptee, I'm an adoptee. We come with all our mm-hmm. baggage and feelings and whatever, but there's not really a place for that necessarily. <laughs> Legislation. <laughs> so do you have some comments on that? Oh, you mean coming with the sort of the difficulties of being adopted or the I would say coming with the the feelings arguments uh, versus what you said it's a right to identity mm-hmm. yeah the feelings the feelings it's a it's a hard balance because you know you have to be human when you when you advocate you have to convince legislators that yes we are human and yes we have feelings but you don't want to overplay those. You have to balance that with the right that you're um, asserting. And so that can be difficult sometimes. I mean, some people come into this legislation with more, I I would say more come into it with um, believing this may solve their issues, that getting the birth record will solve other emotional issues that they may have associated with the adoption. And it 
doesn't necessarily it may contribute to solving issues but the the right to your record and your identity is is the first step it's the, sort of the that basic right of of your record and so that's where you have to sort of concentrate on that record and maybe it's it's potential for use but not um what it can do simply by possessing it and, and it's very meaningful to possess it. i almost cried when i i mean i just got my original birth record unredacted in um november of 2020 so less than a year ago after 20 years of trying to find it and it was very meaningful to get that and that's the first but that's always the first step to whatever you do with it um once you do have it so i think it is a it's a real balance to figure out how you approach legislators and um, convince them that it is a right. You don't back down on that. I mean, if you back down on on this is a right, then they know how to split you off from others who don't believe it's a right or think that you're overplaying what it is. And so you have to be really firm that it is a right. Um, you're not going to back down on that because you're trying to convince them that it is. And that's, I think, very hard for some people, especially adopted people, to be firm in this right because you're taught for most of your life you don't deserve it it's not yours it said you don't deserve it you're going to mess things up if you get it you weren't supposed to know i mean all these sort of myths that go along with that make make it hard i think for some adopted people to say no no i don't care what you think of me think about what i need uh, as a adopted person and the right that i have to have my own birth record it's not your birth record it's mine and so i think that's uh, the hard part to deal with with legislators and they often come to this with all the myths of what an adoptee is and often we're perpetual children i mean that's really at, at the heart of it is we're not treated as full adults we're treated as the at, at the time we were born as children and that's the hardest thing to to listen to and and see underneath it all is that we're not treated as fully human. And that's what we saw in Maryland. I think we saw, you know, there are the myths of we're going to destroy families. We're going to out birth parents. We're going to show up at the door and they would have to hide these birth parents from the shame that, um, that they had, but it was shame that was produced by the state. And so it's shame that's perpetuated by the state today. That's, that's what I think they don't recognize either. Is it's perpetual shame and it's perpetuated by the laws that we currently have. And what are you hearing from um, legislators or other other people that are you're in contact with doing similar work in other um, OBC rights access organizations with the argument about DNA? Like what's what's less shameful? getting your, you know, connected to the third cousin who then, mm -hmm. you know, digs up who your birth mother is versus having your paperwork? Right. It's a, that's a great question. And I sort of take it by making sure we don't put all our eggs into the DNA basket, so to speak. Meaning, I mean, part of it, an argument is always, well, it's, it's become irrelevant in many ways to uh, not provide this record. A lot of legislators still don't get that. They're so protective of the myth that existed when a child was relinquished in the 40s, 50s, and 60s that it doesn't, mat that it doesn't matter to them. So what I often say, too, is that these methods of trying to find out just the names of your parents are so deeply embedded in who we are as adopted people, not all adopted people, but many, that we've been using different methods for decades to do that. We've been using private investigators. We've been using searchers where you pay $2,500 in cash in an envelope through an intermediary. Uh, we have search angels. These, the methods have just, cha has just changed. And DNA has become inexpensive and easy to use. And that's just the method we use now, but it does not substitute for a request uh, for the birth record. And you're provided with that birth record upon request. But you're right, it does. And I've used this in court. If you have DNA and you get these matches to third cousins, second cousins, more increasingly first cousins, and you then get a, I usually use search angels with my clients because I don't do this, the, the investigation to try to find people. That search angel will take that list of matches and then start going down that list. 
And what I've done in many of my court cases where we don't know who the birth parent is, we narrow it down. And then I get an affidavit from the search angel explaining exactly what she, usually she, is going to do over the next two months to try to locate and identify that birth parent. And that means calling 200 people, uh, contacting people on social media, using existing databases to find them. And so I, I put that all in an affidavit and I say to the court, who, to be honest, is the fact finder. They're the ones who are looking at all these facts and making a decision like legislators really should be doing in the sense of creating legislation. And the judges in almost every case say, well, I'm just going to release you the, to the record, the birth record, because that's way better than this route you're outlining here of contacting 40 people and asking the question, do you know um, if a cousin or an aunt or someone gave up a child or surrendered a child to adoption in 1975? That question then reverberates across generations as opposed to requesting the record and receiving it and doing what you want with it. So judges understand that. Um, they respond to it. They're the fact finders, neutral fact finders, hopefully. Uh, legislators have not yet fully understood that. And some don't really want to understand. I, I tell people that this issue is bipartisan. It really is. You get staunch Republicans who are fully in favor of, of a right to your own birth record. You get Democrats who are very similar. It skews a little bit Democratic, depending upon what abortion politics are in play in that state. But the biggest factor, and Annette O'Connell in New York really brought this home to me, is age or generation. It's a generational difference. The younger the legislator is in general, the more they're not going to care, that they're not going to see the big deal. I mean, they're going to care, but they're not going to see the big deal of releasing an identity record. Whereas the older legislators are locked into the myth that developed around adoption in the 40s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s, and are unwilling to let go of that myth. And so it's really skewed by age more than anything else. So I know you're an attorney, and I know you you have this view of the, the courts and the judges, and, and it's very like, like that lot, most of us would not understand. But when you are talking about fighting for your own record... <laughs> And literally saying, mm -hmm. I already have my uh, birth parents' names and I already have this information. Like, what are you feeling inside? Like, it just sounds so ludicrous. Like, like, how can you not give me this paper? Because I already know what it's on, what's on it. Are you just not like, is this all a farce? Like, am I being punked? Like, what is happening right now? <laughs> I mean, that's a good, those are good ways to explain it being punked or, or the absurdity of it was often was really brought home by that whole process. It's like, I, what are you, I don't, I just, they're hiding things for the sake of hiding things at, at some point. They're just, we were so locked into hiding this birth record that that's the reason we're hiding it because we're hiding it. And th that circular absurdity was really what was brought home to me. And, and I, I've written about this on my personal blog. And the one question that I got from a social worker. So in DC, Again, when you unseal the record, they then refer it over to an agency to look at whether there's consent already and then look at whether they should contact the birth parent. My mom was deceased at that point, um, and I had had a relationship with her for the time we knew each other, and I had inherited all of her records, and so and I was part of her, her extended family. But the question I got from the social worker was, do you have proof? of the relationship with your mother. And it was such an absurd question to me for a number of reasons. One is, well, my, the proof is the birth record <laughs> that I'm trying to ask for. There's the proof right there. Her name's right there, and I'm there on that record as well. But the, what I wrote about was all the records that I have. Uh, you know, and, and the absurdity of what I was... I was almost uh, using satire in some ways in what I sent back to the, the social worker. And that satire was I, I gave her Christmas cards that we sent to each other. I gave her uh, other cards that we sent to each other. I gave her, I have a recording of her on New Year's Eve uh, saying New Year's Eve. It's on my, back in the days where you had actual machines that recorded voicemail. 
I have video of being at her home in, in Florida for Christmas. So do, do I send all of those things into the social worker to, to prove that I had a relationship with her? It was just so absurd. And I think that may be where a lot of people would give up. And I, I would not blame them either. And a lot of adoptees probably give up as part of this process. And sometimes it's so hard, especially the court process. But um, I knew I was right. I knew that I had a I had a legal point here to make as well. And I stuck with it. And, you know, I can I can deal with I mean, I've over the years, I've learned how to deal with the absurdity as well. And I think that's what I like as being a lawyer is I can deal with that absurdity in a constructive way. But I do feel for my clients who have to deal with it on a very personal level. I have a client in the last three weeks who's really gone through the ringer. Uh, we've got a birth record, but she wanted a baptismal certificate. She wanted the original baptismal certificate. I don't know if many people know, but in the Catholic Church, they issue amended birth, uh, baptismal certificates that have make it appear as if your adoptive parents were at the baptism, which physically this was impossible. And she wanted her original baptismal certificate. And we got a court order to for the agency to supply it. And the agency said, well, you need to pay our fees to do that. And the fees approached around $400 just to open the file and to release an original baptismal certificate. $400. And it was just so absurd. And there's not much you can do on that because you're dealing with usually a private adoption agency. Um, so they really have all, a lot of power there. And so she paid, I think we negotiated the fee down. But again, the absurdity of hiding things for the sake of hiding them is really what comes home to me and to my clients as well. Well, when you were describing, I so I got emotional when you were describing what you were sending over as satire, you said to your, um, the social worker, I was thinking, like, who who has a right to privacy here? Like, I have to, you know, sorry to say this, use this wording, Greg, but I just what come to my mind. Prostitute my precious memories when I only had 164 days with my birth mother. And now I have to show you all these precious things to me. Like, that is, I, I, I don't have the words for it. I'm, it was no, it was stunning. It really was. I mean, that's why I, I tended to write about it. Um, that was the sort of one way of therapy for me is to is an out, one outlet I would say is is writing. It, yeah, it's stunning what you have to give up of your own personal self to get your records. And this was to get my original birth record. Now it ended up they made they kind of the courts not the courts but. They kind of made a mistake in my case. I mean, I asked for three sets of records, and this is what I t always tell people. There are usually three main records that you're seeking. One is the birth record. It's generally, I mean, it's very hard to get, but generally of those three, it's the easiest to get. The next are court records, which are a little harder to get, depending upon the state. Um, some states will give them to you as part of the birth record. And then the third are the agency records. It could be the public agency or often it's a private agency, and those are the hardest of any to get. Usually it's in a private agency. The courts don't really want to order a private agency to re relinquish records. And in my case, they gave me 77 pages of agency records. They redacted my father's birth name, but I already knew who that was, so I just would fill it in every time that redaction came along. And they just did a poor job redacting it anyways, that you know sometimes his name was there and sometimes it wasn't. But I got the hardest records ever to get. But, and they're also the most revealing. They are probably, if you were to think about three sets of records, they are the most valuable because they have the most information of who you were at that age and what went into the, all these, what went into the machinery of, of your relinquishment and adoption to a new family. And so I learned quite a bit from those agency records. And I, you know, there's a, there was a Georgia adoptee, adoptee that was on our, an event recently, and she also got a scad of agency records, and they were incredibly helpful. But what they couldn't answer for her was she was in foster care for five months, and there there are no records related to that. And that's often the hole that people have. 
I had a seven day hole where I was probably in between the hospital and the maternity home. It's not that hard to fill in those seven days, but the people who have five months to fill where foster care records aren't typically provided anywhere, that's much harder. But you're right. It, it's this whole issue of, you could call it prostituting yourself to, to prove that you're entitled to your own information. It's just bizarre and absurd. And I don't wish it on anyone. And I'm not going to insist on clients to follow through and if they don't want to. I mean, I, can't, I don't have that power. But I certainly leave it up to them as to whether they want to, how much, how hard they want to fight for that and what they have to give up to get it. Thank you for sharing that. We're going to do our recommended resources. But before we do that, is there anything else that you want to say to adopted people or share further about your story or, or anything that you, you really want adopted people to know? I guess, you know, this, I usually don't have New Year's resolutions at all. I just have never been important to me. I did have one this year and it's been really important to me. And I think it's something that I think resonates with adoptees and that is listen. It's to listen and not saying you listen to those voices that you hear all the time, especially in adoption. You know, it, we're, it's often the adoptees not centered when there's discussion about adoption. But I'm talking about what are the voices we're not hearing? right now in adoptee rights work. And a lot of those are transracial adoptees, intercountry adoptees, in-race adoptees. And so these are the voices, I think, that one, it's the future of adoptee rights work. Um, And it's the voices that I think we need to um, not only listen to, but follow. And I'm seeing a lot of that, but I think we still have a lot of work to do to get there. And that's, I think we're going to start talking about the resources and Adoptees United is one of those and we're making a very conscious effort to build our board so it's diverse and inclusive and we'll have more information about that board probably pretty soon now i went to your adoptee rights town hall for adoptees united which is what i want to recommend and i wrote down a quote from you um <laughs> from no, that. oh no oh no, <laughs> no. sometimes i cringe that, that i'm recording and oh no oh come on come on <laughs> okay. this you, you are entirely staying intact here you said domestic adoptees need to be better allies to intercountry adoptees so you said that before you made your uh, new year's resolution so there you go all right you're all good staying intact yeah <laughs> but you know it is it's all it is it is work that we have to do and I, I truly believe that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think, I mean, the other voice that I think we need to listen to, too, especially our um, young adoptees. I have no idea really what's, what issues they're uh, having. And we, we are about to add a young 25-year-old transracial adoptee to our board. And what he listens to and thinks about is very different from what I listen to and think about as a older white domestic adoptee. Mm-hmm. In a, in, a good, in a very good way. I mean, it's just you, you, if you listen and you truly listen, I think that you're gonna, we're going to make some progress. But we also have to act. And acting means acting that's in something that uh, you act positively and what you learn and listen from those who will be and, and should have more power today. That's how I do it. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing your story and so much wisdom about um, adoptee rights. Like, I love that your name is Adoptee Rights Law Center. Like, it's very, <laughs> that's it. That is it. <laughs> well, no, it's, but it also sounds like I'm, I've got a staff of 30 and, you know, I'm a center. And so, Someday? <laughs> Come on. We have, you got to live we into it great. now. That's, that's all. <laughs> that's right. Um, no, I I want I want I want people to go and make sure they're checking out your writing there because I learned a lot from you about integrated birth certificates from a post that's there. Mm-hmm. Recently, you wrote about the five. This is good title too. The five most pernicious myths about adult adopted people. Yeah, it's <laughs> true. Good. and we've talked about some of those today. Yeah, we did. But adoptees united, especially, can you tell us more? about what that organization is uh, meant to do and what your plans are for um, Adoptees United? We're going state by state legislatively. And I was sort of 
for me, it was Minnesota court cases um, and also intercountry adaption, uh, intercountry adaptee work. But we were really limited in having to reinvent in every state or every issue the infrastructure, the lo- lo- logistics, the messaging, all of that. And so we wanted to form a national nonprofit organization that could, one, raise money, two, educate people on these issues and become a national voice on adoptee rights issues and a very specifically oriented towards adoptees right, adoptee rights. It wouldn't be an umbrella organization, with nothing against umbrella organizations, but we're very specific on limiting it to adoptees. But also building coalitions. The coalition was largely responsible for what happened recently in New York. Coalitions work because it brings different organizations together that may not want to work together without having some structure behind it or some bottom line commitment to what we're all after. And so Adoptees United helps form those coalitions. It helps with the logistics of websites. It helps with the logistics of emails. And it, 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 for, it, it helps the local advocates, which make all the difference, those people who are in the state trying to make change, to focus in on their advocacy work. That is going to actually physically going to the legislature and lobbying for the legislation that we need. So it's, so it's a national organization that could raise money, provide education, and also provide logistics behind legislative efforts across the country. And also, uh, hopefully, as we very consciously build our board, become a very diverse and inclusive voice as well. I mean, I, I kind of see myself, I'm mean, the president of Adoptees United, but I kind of see myself more as an administrator to get it to where it needs to go. Uh, I'd like not to be the head of it for you know two years from now. I think it needs to have uh, leadership that changes to reflect where we're going with adoptee rights. But so that's the that's why we have Adoptees United now. And it's going really well. And I think part of that is, to be honest, the ability to draw in people on Zoom and on our Zoom events, like the town hall that you went to. Can adoptees, um, and if not, what's the best way? Can adoptees that are interested in um, changing legislation in their state, but they don't know where to go, Can they Mm -hmm. connect with Adoptees United or where's the best place for people that are itching to do the work go? That's what I would recommend is contact us at Adoptees United. um, There's a form there to fill out or they can certainly just contact me directly at um, Adoptee Rights Law Center because I'll just hook them in. But that's how it, that's how it happens. I mean, it's both a combination of the events that we do and what grows out of those. Um, because we're now actively trying to build coalitions in California. There's a real interest in the southeastern United States coalition. It's not just Florida or Georgia or Louisiana specific. But these regional ones, I think, is a really good model for the future. And partially that because we're such, fun, you know, I say we're such fungible creatures, adoptees. We may have been born in one state, and, but we likely live in another state at this point. And so therefore, we're not a constituent in the state that holds our birth records or any records. And so we're kind of disenfranchised in that way. But regionally, we'd be more powerful in that we're trying to build these regional coalitions. We have one that's the Capital Coalition for Adoptee Rights, and that was the one that was involved in Maryland. And we'll probably see D.C. happening next. Maryland got defeated. Probably going to be a couple of years before we go back to Maryland. But D.C. may be the next one as well. Yeah, so it's it's building those those. Regional coalitions and in the bigger states like California, maybe a state only a state level coalition because it's so big. It is big. I got a lot of California listeners, so hopefully we'll find some people for oh you God. here. It is. It is by <laughs> far. It is by far the most requests I get from adoptees is how to get your birth records in California, and and it's such a such a restricted state. Wow, I'm so excited. Glad we have it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. I think it's really great. So I hope that you guys are able to follow Adoptees United, watch out for their events that are coming up. And if you're itching to, you know, do some work, if you're like ready, um, they're ready for you. Um, what do you want to recommend for us today, Craig? Boy, there's so many books that I have. I, I you know, American Baby is one that um, the book by Gabrielle Glazer. Look at all my book tabs. Yeah. There you- yeah. 
I happen to have one of the few paperback because I have like the galley version. Oh, you so fancy. Yeah. You got reference in this book. <laughs> I know, I saw that. That was so generous of her to do that. And I've been in touch with Gabrielle for a long for a while now and um she's been doing such a terrific job of of getting the issue of secrecy and adoption out there and discussed. And I think it may have even led to that Steve Inski piece that we saw uh more recently. But that that's a book that I'd recommend. Cleave is a book of poetry. I have it or around here tiana nobly oh i just went to her i just went to her um her poetry her, the launch oh cool it was wonderful it, so another one is um by megan galbraith and it's the guild of the infant savior i'm looking forward to that one i think that's out in mid-may end of may yes it's coming out soon and she's going to be on the show so we're oh, good. V- very excited you can look forward to that good but I have a whole pile. I mean, and then I still came across all sorts of books from the past that I've written several years ago that Invisible Asians is one by a professor at, um, in Minnesota. So one that's up that out right now is Surviving the White Gaze by Rebecca Carroll. Um, that's a memoir. She's a, a black adoptee, grew up in a white family in New England and is a cultural critic for, well, has been a cultural critic for many prominent publications in the past. So I, I would I always recommend books and you know I don't often have time to read them so it's like I just listed a bunch of books that I have that I haven't even read yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, but they look so good. <laughs> they look so good. I have read them. <laughs> they are good. I haven't read all of the ones I, you mentioned. But I've read most of right. them. <laughs> Right. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's hilarious. Well, if you would like more dry humor from Greg and uh, wisdom about adoptee rights issues, where can we uh, connect with you online? The best way is probably Adoptee Rights Law Center, and that's at adoptee-rights-law.com. Or I'm more active on Twitter than any other social media, and that's Adoptee Law on, on Twitter. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. I hope Greg will come back because I had so many more questions for him and I just want to know more about the people who are doing such great work on our behalf and like what passions propel them and and I just want to like get all their wisdom so that I can help you advocate and me advocate for other adult adoptees. So what a gem. Love Greg. He is such a gift to the community and has done such great things He's too modest. He's 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 very modest. <laughs> and you he probably wouldn't have told us half of those things without a little pressing. So I'm so thrilled that Adoptees United exists and is going to hopefully uh, connect more advocates nationwide. So I do encourage you, if that's something that's been on your heart, like get after it. We need more people uh, speaking up for. OBC. And I know there's lots of people already doing it. So join in with them and see how many more states you can get opened up uh, down there. Anyway, I am so grateful for Greg's voice and so many of the other guests we've had recently really sharing such powerful things with us. And I'm also very thankful to my Patreon supporters. You know, I couldn't do the show without you. So thank you so much. You know who you are. You know, some people like list off names of Patreon supporters, but I've never done that because I know some of you are very private and you um, don't necessarily want, you know, people to know. But I see you, I know you, and I'm really grateful I wouldn't be able to do this without you. So if you want to join my friends that are supporting the show every month, you can go to adoptezon.com slash partner to find out details of how you can support the show and keep it going and also how you can access my other weekly podcast. (laughs) I do, I do two podcasts a week. I feel like that's too much. Anyway, it's Adoptees Off Script, and we have a monthly book club over there. We have lots of silly news reports. It's not silly, but sometimes I get a little bit silly. News reporting on adoptee things that are happening. We break down uh, news articles that are, you'll, you'll, you'll just, you'll find out the real Haley and how much i want to hear adoptee voices over anybody else's <laughs> i'll just leave it at that um, sometimes to my detriment thank you so much for listening let's talk again and next friday <laughs>